This is Arthur Clarke in Colombo, Sri Lanka, on the 14th of June, 2000. It's now more than 40 years since Stanley Kubrick began his quest for the proverbial good science fiction movie, and already the 1960s seemed to belong to another age. Only a handful of men and one woman had gone into space, and though President Kennedy had announced that the United States would put a man on the moon before the end of the decade, I doubt if many people believed it would actually happen. Moreover, our genuine knowledge of our neighbors in space was still virtually zero. We couldn't even be sure that the first probe to touch down on the moon would not instantly sink into a sea of dust, as some astronomers had confidently predicted. So, in writing our storyline, at the early dawn of the space age, Stanley and I had a credibility problem. We wanted to create something realistic and plausible that would not be made obsolete by the events of the next few years. And though our original working title was How the Solar System Was Won, Stanley was aiming at something more than a straightforward tale of exploration. As he was fond of telling me, what I want is a theme of mythic grandeur. Well, as the real year 2001 approaches, the movie has become part of popular culture. I doubt if even his wildest dreams, Stanley imagined that one day uh, about a hundred million Americans would know exactly who or what was speaking when a Super Bowl commercial announced in a silken yet sinister voice, it was a bug, Dave. And by the way, if anyone still believes the legend that Hal was derived from IBM, by displacing one letter of the alphabet. Let me once again point wearily to chapter 16 for the correct origin of the name. Nowadays, even in my own mind, book and movie tend to be confused with each other and with reality. The various sequels make the situation even more complicated. So I'd like to go back to the beginning and recall how the whole thing started. In April 1964, I left Salon, as it was then called, and went to New York to complete my editorial work on the Time Life book, Man and Space. It progressed very smoothly because whenever one of Time Life's zealous researchers asked me, what is your authority for this statement, I'd fix it with a basilisk stare and answer, you're looking at him. So I had ample energy for moonlighting with Stanley, and our first encounter was in Trader Vic's on April 23rd. They should put up a plaque to mark the spot. Stanley was still basking in the success of his last movie, Dr. Strangelove, and was looking for an even more ambitious theme. He wanted to make a movie about man's place in the universe, a project likely to give a heart attack to any studio head of the old school, or for that matter, of the new one. Now, before you make a movie, you have to have a script. And before you have a script, you have to have a story. Though some avant-garde directors have tried to dispense with the latter item, you'll find their work only at art theatres. I'd already given Stanley a list of my shorter pieces, and we decided that one, The Sentinel, contained a basic idea on which we could build. The Sentinel was written in an explosion of energy at Christmas 1948 as my entry for a BBC short story competition. It wasn't even placed, and I've sometimes wondered who did win. It's now been anthologized so often that I need only say that it's a mood piece about the discovery of an alien artifact on the moon, a kind of burglar alarm waiting to be set off by mankind's arrival. 2001 is often said to be based on the Sentinel, but that's a gross oversimplification. The two bear much the same relationship as an acorn and an oak tree. It needed a lot more material to make the movie, and some of it came from another short story, Encounter in the Dawn and four other shorts. 
but most of it was wholly new and the result of months of brainstorming with Stanley, followed by lonely, well, <laughs> fairly lonely, hours in room 1008 of the famous Hotel Chelsea on 23rd Street, which I was happy to revisit only a few months ago. That's where most of the novel was written, and the journal of this often painful process uh, I've recorded in my book, The Lost Worlds of 2001, which gives a lot of the alternative storylines. But why write a novel, you may ask, when we are aiming to make a movie? It's true that novelizations, horrible word, are all too often produced afterwards, but in this case Stanley had excellent reasons for reversing the process. Because a screenplay has to specify everything in excruciating detail, it's almost as tedious to read as to write. John Fowles put it very well when he said, Writing a novel is like swimming through the sea. Writing a film script is like thrashing through treacle. And perhaps because Stanley realized that I have a low tolerance for boredom, <clears throat> he suggested that before we embark on the drudgery of the script, we let our imagination soar freely by writing a complete novel uh, from which we could later derive the script uh, and hopefully a little cash. Well, that's more or less the way it worked out, though towards the end, novel and screenplay were being written simultaneously with feedback in both directions. Thus, I rewrote some sections after seeing the movie Rushes, a rather expensive method of literary creation which few other authors can have enjoyed, uh, though I'm not sure if enjoyed is the right word. To give the flavor of that hectic time, here's some extracts from the journal I must have hastily written in the smaller hours of the morning. May 28, 1964. Suggested to Stanley that they might be machines who regard organic life as a hideous disease. Stanley thinks this is cute. July 11th. Joined Stanley to discuss plot development, but spent almost all the time arguing about Cantor's transfinite groups. That's numbers beyond infinity. I decide that he's a latent mathematical genius. July 12. Now we have everything except the plot. July 26, Stanley's 36th birthday. Went to the village and found a card with the inscription, How can you have a happy birthday when the whole world may blow up at any minute? Uh, September 28, dreamed I was a robot being rebuilt. Took two chapters to Stanley, who cooked me a fine steak, remarking, Joe Levine doesn't do this for his writers. <laughs> December 10, Stanley calls me after screening H.D. Wells's Things to Come and says you'll never see another movie I recommend. December 24, <laughs> slowly tinkering with the final pages so I can have them as a Christmas present for Stanley. This last entry on Christmas Eve records my hope that the novel was now essentially complete. In fact, all we had was merely a rough draft of the first two-thirds, stopping at the most exciting point, because we hadn't the faintest idea what would happen next. But it was enough to let Stanley set up the deal with MGM and Cinerama for what was originally trumpeted as Journey Beyond the Stars. Throughout 1965, Stanley was involved in the incredibly complex post-production activities, made even more difficult by the fact that the film would be shot in England while he was still in New York, and under no circumstances would he travel by air. I'm in no position to criticize. Stanley learned not to fly the hard way by getting his pilot's license. Uh, for similar reasons, I've never been behind a steering wheel since the day I barely passed my driving test in Sydney, Australia in 1956. I too was cured for life by the traumatic experience. While Stanley was making the movie, I was trying to complete the final, final version of the novel, 
which of course had to receive his blessing before it could be published. This proved extremely difficult to obtain, partly because he was so busy at the studio that he never had time to focus his attention on the many versions of the manuscript. He swore he wasn't dragging his feet to make certain that the movie appeared before the book, uh, which it did by several months in spring 1968. Considering its complex and agonizing gestation, it's not surprising the novel differs from the movie in several respects. Most important, and how lucky this was, we could never have guessed at the time, Stanley decided to rendezvous with Jupiter, whereas in the novel, the spaceship Discovery flew onto Saturn, using Jupiter's gravitational field to boost it on its way. Precisely this perturbation mover, as it's called, was used by the Voyager spacecraft 11 years later. Why the change from Saturn to Jupiter? Well, it made a more straightforward storyline, and more important, the special effects department couldn't produce a Saturn that Stanley found convincing. If it had done so, the movie would have been badly dated by now, because Voyager, the Voyager mission, shows Saturn's rings to be far more implausible and complicated than anyone had ever dreamed. For more than a decade after publication of the novel in July 1968, I indignantly denied that any sequel was possible, or that I had the slightest intention of writing one. But the brilliant success of the Voyager missions changed my mind. Distant worlds, about which absolutely nothing was known, when Stanley and I started our collaboration, suddenly became real places with fantastic surface conditions. Who could ever have imagined satellites entirely covered with ice flows or volcanoes spurting sulfur a hundred kilometers into space? Science fiction could now be made far more convincing by science fact. 2010, Odyssey 2, was about the real Jupiter satellite system. There's also another profound distinction between the two books. 2001 was written in an age which now lies beyond one of the great divides in human history. We are sundered from it forever by the moment when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped out onto the sea of tranquility. Now history and fiction had become inextricably intertwined. The Apollo astronauts had already seen the film when they left for the moon. The crew of Apollo 8, who at Christmas 1968 became the first men ever to set eyes upon the lunar far side, told me that they had been tempted to radio back the discovery of a large black monolith. Alas, discretion prevailed. The Apollo 13 mission, however, does have an uncanny connection with 2001. When the computer HAL reported the failure of the AE-35 unit, the phrase he or it used was, Sorry to interrupt the festivities, but we have a problem. Well, when the Apollo 13 command module, <laughs> named Odyssey, and the crew had just concluded a TV broadcast with the movie's famous uh, thruster theme when an oxygen tank exploded. Their first words back to Earth were, Houston, we've had a problem. When NASA Administrator Tom Paine sent me the report of the mission, he wrote on the cover, just as you always said it would be, Arthur. Uh, in an earlier draft of the novel, David Bowman had to make an EVA in one of Discovery's space pods and chase the ship's lost communications and telesystem. He caught up with it, but was unable to check its slow spin and bring it back to Discovery. Well, in November 1984, astronaut Joe Allen left the space shuttle Discovery, no, I'm not making this up, and used his maneuvering unit to rendezvous with a satellite that had been launched into the wrong orbit. Unlike Bowman, he was able to check its spin by bursts from the nitrogen jet thrusters on his backpack. The satellite was brought back into Discovery's car cargo bay 
and safely returned to Earth for repair and relaunched. After one of the most remarkable and successful shuttle missions ever flown to that date. And I haven't quite finished. Just about the t- time Joe was doing all this, I received a copy of his beautiful book, Entering Space, An Astronaut's Odyssey, with a covering letter that read, Dear Arthur, when I was a boy, you infected me with both the writing bug and the space bug, but neglected to tell me how difficult either undertaking can be. I need hardly say that this sort of tribute gives me a warm glow of satisfaction, but it also makes me feel a contemporary of the Wright brothers. Uh, The novel has sometimes been criticized for explaining too much and thus destroying some of the movie's mystery. Uh, Rock Hudson stormed out of the premiere, complaining, Can someone tell me what the hell this is all about? But I'm quite unrepentant. The printed text has to give much more detail than can be shown on the screen. And I've compounded the, fol- I've compounded the felony by writing 2010, which Peter Hyams made into an excellent movie, and two other novels, 2061 and 3001. No trilogy should have more than four volumes, so I promise that 3001 is indeed the final odyssey. Little more than two weeks after writing the words in this foreword, I received the shocking and completely unexpected news that Stanley had died at the age of 70. He was planning a special promotion of the movie in the year 2001. I'm very sad that I won't be able to share the occasion with him. Um, Although we met not very often in the decades since the film was made, we did remain in friendly touch. And a few nights ago, I had dreamed that we were talking together. He was exact, looking exactly the same as in 1964. And he asked me, well, what should we do next? There might have been a next involving Brian Aldous's beautiful short story, Super Toys Last All Summer Long, which Stanley worked on for some time under the title AI. Uh, but for new several reasons this fell through and I believe Steven Spielberg is now working on it. One of my deepest regrets now is that we won't be able to welcome the year 2001 together.